cargo for callisto by richard e lamb from young readers science fiction stories this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. reading by matt perard a big rocket freighter was speeding through the stardust of outer space it was carrying supplies to callisto one of the twelve moons of jupiter and the shannons on another space adventure steve and sue looked out a window of the freighter at the airless world growing in size callisto was a gigantic roughened rock but it was a globe larger than the planet mercury it reminded steve of a giant cockleburr hanging in the sky suddenly the children heard a tiny voice behind them say rocket away they turned and sue exclaimed it's bud the blue parakeet a budgy blinked lazily at them the twins had met mr whittle's pet a week ago he had taken a liking to them from the very start they didn't know that a few hours from now their very lives would depend on this little fellow we'd better take him back to mr whittle steve said the budgy kept studying them with his flat face and blinking his tiny button eyes then he squawked again rocket away it'll be rocket away for you young fellow steve said sternly up on my finger bud the bird did as he was ordered they took him down the hall to mr whittle's room bud's owner off duty now was a tall spidery crewman with a big adam's apple he always gave his pet full run of the ship mr whittle whistled to the parakeet but the bird stayed on steve's finger mr whittle chuckled hey i believe he likes you two better than his master we like him too sue told the crewman you can keep him for a few days if you want to mr whittle said i'm going to be pretty busy after we land gee we'd like to look after him steve answered if you take him outside on callisto you'll have to put him in that airtight cage over there i had made it's sort of like a spacesuit for him sue and steve played with bud in the room they used for games until it was time to strap down for landing then they went to the couch hall and lay down on cots like the other space travelers were doing they buckled straps across their bodies to keep them in place for a long time steve and sue lay there as the big freighter began cutting its rushing speed it felt to steve as if a giant anvil were crushing downward on his chest take-off and landing were always the roughest moments in space travel as the twins had already found out on other space trips at last the ship sat down on callisto the young shannons went back to the game room then with the bird on steve's shoulder the twins looked out the window at the strange new world they saw a land bathed in ghostly twilight very little light was coming from the sun it was so far away that it was only a small circle most of the light came from a huge shape that looked like somebody's lost beach ball resting on the ground its bottom edge just touched the horizon sue and steve were joined by their father who worked for the space freight company that's his majesty jupiter the king of planets mr shannon told them he's over a million miles away and yet he looks close enough to touch doesn't he let's go outdoors dad steve begged no reason why we can't mr shannon replied after they had put on their space clothes steve popped bud into his warm airtight cage as they all went outside they saw the crewmen unloading the cargo there's the colony over there mr shannon said pointing to a high framework that looked something like an oil derrick they mine here for a mineral called magna it's very valuable because without it we couldn't have atomic engines magna is what keeps our rocket tubes from melting under the terrific heat that goes through them may we go down into the mines dad steve asked we'll see if we can said his father as they walked toward the mining place mr shannon said underneath us are pockets of poisonous gas like that found in jupiter's atmosphere 
sometimes it leaks into the mining tunnels causing danger from suffocation i sure hope the gas stays where it belongs while we're down there steve said and swallowed the lump of fear in his throat they turned their attention to jupiter it looked even more like a beach ball now with its stripes of beautiful colors mr shannon said the bands were floating icebergs of the poisonous gases he was talking about no ship can land on jupiter he said its gravity would crush a spaceman flat gravity pull is much stronger on the larger planets you know jupiter's atmosphere is many thousands of miles deep raging storms are going on beneath it all the time Ooh, sue gasped i guess we're close enough to it then other wonders of the sky were the round beacons of jupiter's other moons three of which were about the same size as callisto they hung like bright searchlights in the starry heavens the men at the mining place greeted the shannons warmly they had not seen anyone from earth for so long that they had grown very lonely the chief mining engineer said he would be glad to take the visitors on an underground tour his name was dr harding he was plump and short and wore black rimmed glasses inside his face helmet he led them into an elevator and it sank into the darkness steve remembered about the poisonous gases that crept about underground and it made him shiver to think about it dr harding watched bud hopping around uncomfortably inside his small space cage do you remember mr shannon he asked over his suit radio when they used to use canary birds in mines to warn about leaking gas the birds would notice it first and give the miners time to get out i've read about that dr harding said mr shannon now we have automatic warning machines in the tunnels to do that the chief engineer told sue and steve deeper and deeper below the soil of callisto the elevator sank at last the cage reached the bottom and the riders found themselves in a large cavern there were machines and men all about working busily tracks led off into tunnels and ore cars were running on them some were going empty into the tunnels while others were coming out full of rock and gravel the magna is separated from the rock in that big machine over there dr harding explained want to ride an ore car into one of the tunnels sure steve spoke up the mine is air-conditioned the chief engineer said so we can take off our helmets this done steve let bud out of his cage the little bird hopped up on his glove finger saying rocket away several times his two-word language seemed to do for everything one worker controlled all the cars at a main switch in the middle of the cavern the shannons and their guide climbed into an empty ore car and it rolled into a tunnel glistening dark rock crowded in on sue and steve from all sides steve hoped the walls were strong enough so they would not come crashing down on their heads there were lights along the way to help brighten the gloom after clicking along like a trolley for a while the car came to the end of the line it was a large room with more machines and workmen the men were digging magna ore out of the wall with drills as dr harding explained about the work bud began flitting about as though sightseeing on his own he was shy of the workers at first but then made friends with them he spoke to them with his favorite two words and the men laughed in great fun to hear him then a few minutes later bud began acting queerly he flew back to steve's finger and started wobbling as though dizzy what's the matter with him steve asked he's sick or something sue cried out she took the budgie from steve and cuddled him in her own gloves but the little blue bird seemed to be no better dr harding walked over to look at the bird then he ordered everybody into the ore car we have to get out of here fast sue hold the bird up close to your suit the workers dropped their tools as if they were red hot and climbed into the car mr shannon helped sue and steve on then jumped on himself dr harding pressed the electric button that was the signal to the operator in the main cavern to move the car 
the car began to roll down the track it picked up speed as dr harding kept pressing the button leaking gas dr harding mr shannon asked worriedly the chief engineer nodded he sniffed the air like a hunting dog after a scent take a deep breath everyone then hold it steve thought his lungs would burst but finally dr harding let them take another deep breath by the time they had taken one more the car had reached the main cavern as it rolled to a stop dr harding jumped down and ran over to the car operator steve saw a door slide open and close off the tunnel where they had come out then the little man gave a deep sigh and took off his black-rimmed glasses to wipe them sue and steve watched bud hopefully he was standing more steadily on sue's finger now i think he'll be all right the chief engineer said we sure owe bud a lot for warning us the way he did something must have happened to the warning machine it was supposed to set off a siren if it weren't for bud we might have been overcome before we could have gotten out of there mr shannon added you're so right dr harding said the men will go back in there in gas masks to find the leak and see what's wrong with the warning machine we're plenty lucky steve sighed his spine still prickly from their narrow escape sue kissed the budgie you're a hero bud she told him and we love you bud blinked lazily then as if to show that he was all right again he squawked rocket away end of cargo for callisto by richard elam Chin Chin Kobakama by Lafcadio Hearn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The floor of a Japanese room is covered with beautiful, thick, soft mats of woven reeds. They fit very closely together so that you can just slip a knife blade between them. They are changed once every year and are kept very clean. The Japanese never wear shoes in the house and do not use chairs or furniture such as English people use. They sit, sleep, eat, and sometimes even write upon the floor. So the mats must be kept very clean indeed, and Japanese children are taught, just as soon as they can speak, never to spoil or dirty the mats. Now, Japanese children are really very good. All travelers who have written pleasant books about Japan declare that Japanese children are much more obedient than English children, and much less mischievous. They do not spoil and dirty things, and they do not even break their own toys. A little Japanese girl does not break her doll. No, she takes great care of it, and keeps it even after she becomes a woman and is married. When she becomes a mother and has a daughter, she gives the doll to that little daughter, and the child takes the same care of the doll that her mother did, and preserves it until she grows up, and gives it at last to her own children, who play with it just as nicely as their grandmother did. So I, who am writing this little story for you, have seen in Japan dolls more than a hundred years old looking just as pretty as when they were new. This will show you how very good Japanese children are, and you will be able to understand why the floor of a Japanese room is nearly always kept clean not scratched and spoiled by mischievous play. You ask me whether all, all Japanese children are as good as that? Well, no, there are a few, a very few naughty ones. And what happens to the mats in the houses of these naughty children? Nothing very bad, because there are fairies who take care of the mats. These fairies tease and frighten children who dirty or spoil the mats. At least, they used to tease and frighten such mischievous children, I am not quite sure whether those little fairies still live in Japan, because the new railways and the telegraph poles have frightened a great many fairies away. But here is a little story about them. Once there was a little girl who was very pretty, but also very lazy. Her parents were rich and had a great many servants, and these servants were very fond of the little girl and did everything for her which she ought to have been able to do for herself. Perhaps this is what made her so lazy. When she grew up into a beautiful woman, she still remained lazy, 
but as the servants always dressed and undressed her and arranged her hair, she looked very charming, and nobody thought about her faults. At last she was married to a brave warrior and went away with him to live in another house, where there were but few servants. She was sorry not to have as many servants as she had had at home, because she was obliged to do several things for herself, which other folks had always done for her. It was such trouble to her to dress herself and take care of her own clothes and keep herself looking neat and pretty to please her husband. But as he was a warrior and often had to be far away from home with the army, she could sometimes be just as lazy as she wished. Her husband's parents were very old and good-natured and never scolded her. Well, one night, while her husband was away with the army, she was awakened by queer little noises in her room. By the light of a big paper lantern she could see very well, and she saw strange things. What? Hundreds of little men, dressed just like Japanese warriors, but only about one inch high, were dancing all around her pillow. They wore the same kind of dress her husband wore on holidays, kamashimo, a long robe with square shoulders, and their hair was tied up in knots and each wore two tiny swords. They all looked at her as they danced and laughed and they all sang the same song over and over again. Chin chin kobakama, yomofuke soro, oshizumare, himegime, yatonton, which meant we are the chin chin kobakama, the hour is late, sleep, honorable noble darling. The words seemed very polite, but she soon saw that the little men were only making cruel fun of her. They also made ugly faces at her. She tried to catch some of them, but they jumped about so quickly that she could not. Then she tried to drive them away, but they would not go, and they never stopped singing Chin Chin Kobakama and laughing at her. Then she knew they were little fairies and became so frightened that she could not even cry out. They danced around her until morning, then they all vanished suddenly. She was ashamed to tell anybody what had happened, because, as she was the wife of a warrior, she did not wish anybody to know how frightened she had been. Next night, again, the little men came and danced, and they came also the night after that, and every night, always at the same hour, which the old Japanese used to call the hour of the ox, that is, about two o'clock in the morning by our time. At last she became very sick, through want of sleep and through fright. But the little men would not leave her alone. When her husband came back home, he was very sorry to find her sick in bed. At first, she was afraid to tell him what had made her ill, for fear that he would laugh at her. But he was so kind and coaxed her so gently that after a while she told him what happened every night. He did not laugh at her at all, but looked very serious for a time. Then he asked, At what time do they come? She answered, Always at the same hour, the hour of the ox. Very well, said her husband. Tonight I shall hide and watch for them. Do not be frightened. So that night the warrior hid himself in a closet in the sleeping room and kept watch through a chink between the sliding doors. He waited and watched until the hour of the ox. Then, all at once, the little men came up through the mats and began their dance and their song. Chin chin kobakama, yomo fuke soro. They looked so queer and danced in such a funny way that the warrior could scarcely keep from laughing. But he saw his young wife's frightened face and then remembering that nearly all Japanese ghosts and goblins are afraid of a sword, he drew his blade and rushed out of the closet and struck at the little dancers. Immediately they all turned into, what do you think? Toothpicks. There were no more little warriors, only a lot of old toothpicks scattered over the mats. The young wife had been too lazy to put her toothpicks away properly, and every day, after having used a new toothpick, she would stick it down between the mats on the floor to get rid of it. So the little fairies who take care of the floor mats became angry with her and tormented her. Her husband scolded her, and she was so ashamed that she did not know what to do. A servant was called, and the toothpicks were taken away and burned. After that, the little men never came back again. There's also a story told about a lazy little girl who used to eat plums, and afterward hide the plum stones between the floor mats. For a long time she was able to do this without being found out, but at last the fairies got angry and punished her. For every night, tiny, tiny women, all wearing bright red robes with very long sleeves, rose up from the floor at the same hour and danced and made faces at her and prevented her from sleeping. Her mother one night sat up to watch and saw them and struck at them, 
and they all turned into plum stones. So the naughtiness of that little girl was found out. After that, she became a very good girl indeed. End of Chin Chin Kobakama by Lafcadio Hearn Read by Colleen McMahon Home for the Holidays by William Bennett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The boy home for the holidays is always suspected of all manner of mischief. I know that I, Charlie Mitford, found it so when I was home for my last Christmas holidays. Everything that went wrong was sure to be my fault. Sometimes I was blamed justly, but generally, I thought, unjustly. I will tell you about one scrape of mine. My father had invited a middle-aged gentleman, who was a learned professor, and a terrible bookworm, to spend a week or two at our house. I didn't like Dr. Milbank, and he hated me and all other boys. I generally kept out of his way, but one day, the doctor being in a more friendly and talkative mood than ordinary, I ventured to accompany him into the library, taking care only to speak to him when he condescended to speak to me. The doctor, however, soon became lost in a book, and altogether forgot my presence. I accordingly retired into the recess of a window, and also engaged myself with a book on old sports and pastimes. Dr. Milbank's back was turned upon me, and he was thoroughly lost in his studies. Now, learned as was the doctor in his special subjects, mostly of the dry-as-dust order, he knew but little of the natural history of magpies, and at the present moment my interest, and the interest of my story, is with one of those birds, Jack by name. He was a tame magpie, a clever talker, and a great pet in our household, though he was as mischievous, almost, as they say I was. He came hopping into the library unseen by the doctor, but watched by my observant eyes. He stealthily posted himself on a chair. It seemed that there was something on his mind. While he was ensconced in his citadel of the chair, he kept his cunning, twinkling eyes fixed on the doctor's silver spectacles on his nose. Magpies are fond of pilfering bright or glittering articles, and with secret joy I saw that Jack was meditating a theft. Perched, however, in his elevated position, and seeing no hope for the present of purloining the spectacles, he stealthily took the leather case which the doctor had laid upon the table after taking the glasses therefrom. Then he stealthily hopped out of the room. A few minutes later the doctor, weary of his book, took his spectacles from his nose, and naturally enough sought the case to place them in. The case was not to be found. This is most mysterious. I know I placed it on the table. Dear me, dear me, always something to annoy me. It was very wrong, no doubt, to laugh at the misfortunes or annoyances of other people. But I was home for the holidays, you know, and I really couldn't help it. He laid down his spectacles on the table while he took a walk round the room, frowning in his displeasure and mystification. Then he spied me lounging with outstretched legs in the recess with my book of sports. Ah, ah, Master Charles, and so you are the culprit, are you? Sir, I exclaimed, affecting to be ignorant of his meaning. My spectacle case, where is it? Spectacle case? I have not got it. What? Why, I laid it beside me on the table, and now it is gone. You should not take such liberties with your elders. Why, sir, I have not moved from the spot where I am sitting, and it is a very hard case for me to be accused of removing it. Your joke is impertinent at a time like this. You are the only person, as I said before, who has been in the library since I have been reading here. Excuse me, doctor. Do not interrupt me, Master Charles. I must ring the bell for your father. Boys home for the holidays take so much license nowadays that really they have become an intolerable nuisance. There should be no school holidays if I could have my way. As he spoke, the doctor advanced to the bell rope. He walked with his back toward the door, and as he did so, my old friend Jack, the magpie, came hop-hop-hopping in and his thievish eye at once fell upon the silver specks. 
which the enraged man had laid down on the very spot on the table where before he had laid the case which had so disgraced me in his eyes jack quietly hopped upon his old quarters in the armchair and as quickly possessed himself of the envied trophy and i became the innocent witness of another theft much greater than the last deeper disgrace to me i thought but as the doctor was evidently sure i was the culprit and was not likely to accept any explanation from me i thought it best to keep quiet though by this i no doubt made myself jack's accessory a servant answered the bell and he was requested to send my father hither and of course my father came well doctor what can i have the pleasure of doing for you he inquired you appear agitated what is the matter look here sir if you please said the doctor to my father i laid my spectacle case on the table where you see my glasses and here he pointed to the table and my father looked on the spot indicated and said where doctor where i see no glasses we were all standing some distance from the table and the doctor could not see what was on it he only spoke from the knowledge that he had placed his spectacles on the table to which he now drew near when to his great surprise and to my greater amusement he made the same discovery that my father had done that there were no glasses there why sir not five minutes ago i laid my glasses on this spot he exclaimed giving the table a rather loud rap with his knuckles which did not harm the table though it did the knuckles as the doctor's screwed-up face indicated. There, sir, exactly there, and now you see with your own eyes that both case and spectacles are gone. It is a very mysterious occurrence, Dr. Milbank, remarked my father. I cannot say that I see any mystery about it, sir. I am no believer in spiritualism, but I am in logic. I laid the spectacles and the case there on that table. They are now gone. No one has been in the room but Master Charles. Ergo, Master Charles must have them, interrupted my father. That is the true inference of your logic. Just then, another visitor came hopping into the room, no less than my father's favorite, Jack the Magpie. My father was now seated by the side of the doctor, and the bird, as was his custom, hopped and flew to his shoulder, which was his favorite perch when he had the opportunity. Well, Pa, said the cunning bird, bending his head and beak to my parent's face. "'And what do you want, Master Jack?' "'Show,' said the magpie, which was another daily phrase of his which he had picked up. Then he pretended to be sleepy, winking and blinking, and even yawning and crying, "'Poor Jack! Poor Jack!' "'A fine, rare bird, Mr. Mitford, is your magpie,' said the doctor, who would not have said so much had he known, as I did, that Jack was the author of his misery. "'By the by,' cried my father, I wonder if the magpie had taken the things from the table. Tell the truth, I said, catching the bird up by his tail, much to his displeasure. What have you done with the spectacles? Show, screamed the bird, making diverse pecks at my hands. Depend upon it, my friend, said my father. It is the magpie who is the thief. Easier said than proved, dare, sir, replied the doctor. I know this however, that I would not keep a bird capable of such thefts. But I am surprised, Mr. Mitford, that you should suggest such a solution to the mystery. It is quite a vulgar error to suppose that magpies are thieves of anything but that which contributes to their sustenance. If a magpie will take one bright thing, he will take another. There is a silver pencil case, said the incredulous doctor, placing it on the table, when, to his great surprise, the bird, that had hitherto been immovable, hopped from my father's shoulder to the armchair. Now, sir, if the bird took my glasses, and if it is his nature to steal, he will soon possess himself of the pencil case. Not when he is observed, perhaps. Jack, like human thieves, doesn't like his evil propensities to be seen. Then let us all retire and leave the magpie with the pencil case. What then? Why, that when we return you will find the bird and the case both flown. A bargain, sir, said the doctor, quite pleased that he should soon have the satisfaction of proving my father in the wrong. We all retired to the dining-room, and had a little agreeable talk about magpies, 
and the plot that had been laid to discover whether Jack was a thief or not. An hour later I asked whether I should go and look after the bird in the case. "'No thanks, Master Charles,' said the doctor. "'I object to that. You are home for the holidays. We will all go together when your father is prepared.' "'I'm quite ready, sir.' So we all went to the library and to the table. Bird and pencil case had vanished. The doctor was astonished. I and my father were not, but laughed to each other at the doctor's expression of surprise. "'What do you say now, doctor?' quizzed my delighted parent. "'That they are gone,' he replied. "'It could not be by the boy home for the holidays now, could it?' "'But the bird, sir, where is the bird?' exclaimed the doctor, who fairly felt himself in a dilemma. "'Go on to his storehouse,' replied my father. "'And where is that? I have not been able to discover. Have you taken any means to do so?' "'I have not. Can you suggest any?' inquired my father. "'Watch him,' was the laconic but sensible reply. "'But the cunning fellow has committed his depredations when he has not been seen.' Plant some temptation for him as now, and then place three or four persons to watch where he takes it. A very good idea, and I will follow it out now, if you please. I should like very much, for my curiosity is now deeply excited. Ah, uh, Master Charles, you are a boy of an excellent temper to bear so well as you have done with my petulance and hasty conclusions. Now, said my father, I will place my gold pencil case on the spot where you placed your silver one, and then wait the return of the sly old bird. This was done, and it was not many minutes before the bird entered, no doubt to see if there were any more bright things to be taken away. What? Another pencil case for Jack? No one was in the room but the doctor, who this time pretended to be deeply engaged in a book, as I had before done, while I and my father planted ourselves in unseen places outside the room. The bird was not slow in accomplishing his theft, and as quickly hopped out of the library with the pencil case. "'Seeing is believing,' exclaimed the doctor, closing the book with a loud bang. "'I shouldn't keep a magpie for the world.' Then he made his way to the courtyard, where I and my father had stationed ourselves. We had not been here long before the bird came hopping along with a pencil case in his beak, and he flew to the top of a loft. The doctor's countenance expressed indescribable surprise, while I and my father laughed heartily as Jack flew up to his hiding place. We all ascended the ladder, and when we had got to the roof, there, in a leaden valley between two angles, we discovered a hoard of bright things, among others the cases and spectacles belonging to Dr. Milbank. "'What do you say now, doctor?' triumphantly asked my father extending his hands over the magpie's storehouse and handing him back his property. "'That I will never keep a magpie,' he returned, shaking his head, placing his hands behind the tail of his long clerical-cut coat, and blushing and laughing. During a little conversation between us on the top of the loft, the saucy bird returned, looking unutterable things and screaming when he saw us there, and his hoard disturbed. When the doctor held up his glasses, and was about to admonish him, the bird turned tail upon us and flew off, croaking, Shoo! Shoo! And we did not see him for two days afterward. He was evidently deeply offended. Indeed, Jack was not the same bird afterward, and was even cold and indifferent to the caresses of my father. As for Master Charles, he dare not touch Jack's tail. On taking his departure, the doctor, smiling good-naturedly, remarked, I assure you, Mr. Mitford, until now I set down all these wonderful stories of animals that we meet with as fabulous. But your bird, sir, has taught me a wholesome lesson, that things may nevertheless be true, whether we believe them or not. And further, I have had a warning not to be too hasty in coming to conclusions with boys home for the holidays, upon circumstantial evidence. And still further, that as long as I wear spectacles, I will never keep a magpie. We each and all had a hearty laugh, a shake of the hand, and the doctor took his departure. When he next loses his spectacles, he will inquire if there is a magpie around. 
End of Home for the Holidays by William Bennett Read by Donald Cummings A Legend of the Flowers by Anonymous from the Turquoise Storybook by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Berard. A Legend of the Flowers by Anonymous. Australian Adapted. Long, long ago, the great Bayami left the earth and went to dwell in the faraway land of rest which was beyond the tops of the ubi ubi mountain the earth became a dull and desolate place after he left it for all the flowers that brightened the plains and hillsides ceased to bloom and since there were no blossoms the bees could no longer make honey for the earth children in all the land there were but three trees where the bees lived and worked and no one ever touched these sacred trees because they belonged to Bayami. The children cried for honey, and the mothers took little bark baskets into the woods to search for the sweet food, but they returned with empty baskets and said, There is no honey except on the sacred trees. We will never touch Bayami's honey. This obedience pleased the great spirit very much, and he said, i'll send the earth children a food as sweet as the honey for which they hunger it shall flow from the bilbil and gulaba trees soon we're seeing white sugary specks on the shining leaves of these trees and then came the clear manna which ran along the branches and down the trunks and hardened into sugar the children were delighted with the sweet food and all the people were thankful for Bayami's gift but they were not satisfied, for they still wished to see the plains and hillsides covered with blossoms. So deeply did they long for the beautiful flowers which had left the earth that the wise men finally said, We will travel to the land of Bayan, and ask him to brighten the earth again with flowers. They kept the plan and purpose of their journey a secret from the tribes, and sped away to the northeast on and on they journeyed until they came to the foot of the great ubi ubi mountain whose summit was lost in the clouds of the sky they walked along the base of its rocky sides wondering how they could scale the steep ascent when suddenly they spied a foothold cut in a rock and then they noticed another step and still another looking carefully upward they saw a pathway of steps cut as far as they could see up the mountainside up this ladder of stone they determined to climb on and on they went and when the first day's ascent was ended the top of the mountain still seemed high above them they noticed too that they were climbing a spiral path which wound round and round the mountain not until the end of the fourth day's climb did they reach the summit of this mighty mountain and from a basin in the marble there bubbled forth a spring of clear sweet water which the wise men drank eagerly their hard journey had almost exhausted them but the cooling draught filled them again with new life at a little distance from the spring they saw a circle of piled up stones they walked to the centre of it and a voice spoke to them it came from a fairy messenger of the great spirit why have the wise men of the earth ventured so near to the dwelling of Bayami? asked the spirit voice. And the men answered, Since the great Bayami left the earth, no flowers have bloomed there. We have come to ask for the gift of flowers, because the earth is very dreary without their gay colors. Then the fairy messenger's voice said, Attendant spirits of the mountain, lift the wise men into the abode of Bayami, where faithless flowers never cease to bloom of these blossoms wise men you may gather as many as you can hold in your hands after you have gathered the flowers the attendant spirits will lift you back into the magic circle on the summit of ubi ubi from this place you must return as quickly as possible to your tribes 
as the voice stopped speaking the men were lifted up through an opening in the sky and set down in a land of wondrous beauty everywhere brilliant flowers were blooming and they were massed together in lines of exquisite colors which looked like hundreds of rainbows lying on the grass the wise men were overcome by the marvelous sight and they wept tears of joy remembering what they had come for they stooped down and gathered quickly as many blossoms as they could hold the spirits then lifted them down again into the magic circle on the top of ubi ubi there they heard again the voice of the fairy messenger who said tell your people when you take them these flowers that never again shall the earth be bare and dreary all through the seasons certain blossoms shall be brought by the different winds but the east wind shall bring them in abundance to the trees and shrubs among the grasses on plains and hillsides flowers shall bloom as thick as hairs on an opossum's skin when the sweet-breathed wind does not blow first to bring the showers and then the flowers the bees can make only enough honey for themselves during this time manna shall again drop from the trees and it shall take the place of honey until the east wind once more blows the rain down the mountains and opens the blossoms for the bees then there will be honey enough for all now make haste and take this promise and the fadeless flowers which are a sign of it to your people the voice ceased and the wise men carrying their fadeless blossoms began the journey back to their people down the stone ladder cut by the spirits of the mountain they went across the plains over the moors back to the camp of the tribes their people flocked around them gazing with wide-eyed wonder at the blossoms the air was filled with a delicious fragrance and the flowers were as fresh as when they were plucked in the land of Biami. when the people had gazed for some time at the beautiful flowers and had heard the promise sent to them by Biami, the wise men scattered their precious gift far and wide some of the lovely blossoms fell on the treetops some on the plains and hillsides and ever since that far-off day the earth has been blessed with the gift of flowers End of A Legend of the Flowers by Anonymous Patsy by Ralph Henry Barbour This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. He made his first appearance one afternoon, a week or so before the fall handicap meeting. Mosher, Fosgill, Alien, Ronimus, and several more of us were down at the end of the field, putting the shot. Fosgill, who was scratch man that year, had just done an even forty feet, and the shot had trickled away toward the cinder path. Whereupon, a small bit of humanity appeared from somewhere, picked up the sixteen pounds of lead with much difficulty, and staggered back to the circle with it. "'Hello, kid,' said Fosgill. "'That's pretty heavy for you, isn't it?' "'Nah,' was the superb reply. "'That ain't nothing.' We laughed, and the youngster grinned around at us in a companionable way that won us on the spot. "'What's your name?' asked Ronimus. "'Patsy.' "'Patsy what?' "'Burns.' "'How old are you?' Levin. "'You're a Frenchman, aren't you?' "'Nah.' "'You're not?' Ronimus pretended intense surprise. "'He's a Dutchman, aren't you, Patsy?' said Mosher. "'Nah.' "'What are you, then?' "'Mucker,' answered Patsy with a grin. For the rest of that day, and for many days afterwards, Patsy honored us with his presence. After each put, he ambled forth, lifted the metal ball from the ground with two dirty little hands, snuggled it against the front of his dirty little shirt, and labored back with it. At the end of the week, Patsy had become official helper. He was a diminutive wisp of humanity, a starved, slender elf with a freckled face, wizened and peaked, which at times looked a thousand years old. It reminded you of the face of one of those preternaturally aged monkeys that sit motionless in a dark corner of the cage, 
oppressed with the sins and sorrows of a hundred centuries. And yet it mustn't be supposed that Patsy was either a pessimist or a misanthrope. Patsy's gray Irish eye could sparkle merrily, and his thin little Irish mouth usually wore a whimsical smile. It was as though he realized that life was but a hollow mockery, and yet had bravely resolved to pretend otherwise, that we, young and innocent, might still preserve our cherished illusions. We made a good deal of Patsy. We pretended that he was very, very old and sophisticated, not a difficult task, and deferred to his judgment on all occasions. But in spite of this, Patsy never became fresh. To be sure, he speedily began calling Fosgill Bull, but I don't think he meant the slightest disrespect. Everyone called the big fellow Bull, and it is quite possible that Patsy believed it to be a title of honor. He was attentive to all of us, but his heart was Fosgill's. He used to wait outside the locker building until we came out after dressing, and then walk beside Fosgill until he reached the square. Then Patsy would say, Good night, Bull. And Fosgill would answer gravely, Good night, Patsy. And Patsy would disappear. But the evening of the handicaps we took him back to the boarding house with us, and he sat beside Fosgill and ate ravenously of everything placed before him. We learned Patsy's life story that evening. He went to school, generally. He lived with Brian. Brian was his brother, eighteen years old, and a man of business. Brian drove for Connors, the teamster. Patsy wasn't sure that he had ever had a mother, but he was absolutely certain about his father. He still had vivid recollections of the night they broke down the door and put the handcuffs on father, after father had laid out the lieutenant with a chair. Patsy didn't know just what father had done, but he had an idea it was something regarding the disappearance of numerous suits of clothes from a tailor's shop. Patsy was going into business himself just as soon as they let him stop school. He was going to sell papers. He had tried several times to wean himself from education, but each time they hailed him back to the schoolhouse. Patsy thought the thing was terribly wrong. When the snow covered the field, we saw Patsy only occasionally. In the spring we got to work early. We believed we had a good show to win the duel that year, and a fighting chance at the intercollegiate. We were strong on the sprints and distances, fair at the jumps and hurdles, and rather weak at the weights. We had a good man in Foskill at the shot put, but that's about all. Along in May we had it doped out that if we could get first in the shot put, we could win out by a point or two. But there wasn't anything certain about it, for our opponent was strong on second, near second, and third place men. Patsy appeared with the first warm day looking thinner and littler and older than ever. That first day the assistant manager was holding the tape for us, and it occurred to him to pick up the shot and toss it back. But he did it only once. The next time Patsy was astraddle that sixteen-pound lump and was looking the assistant manager sternly in the eye. "'I'm doing this,' said Patsy. After that he did it, and no one disputed his right. When the gates were closed, and the fellows had to show their HAA tickets to get in, Patsy was admitted without question. When all the other youngsters for miles around were gluing their faces to the iron fence, watching the baseball games, Patsy's allegiance never faltered. He was somewhere around Fosgill, regarding that hero with worshipping gaze. It was in May, I think, that Patsy made his great resolution. He confided it to us on the steps of the locker building when we were waiting for one of the crowd. "'I've decided not to go into business,' said Patsy. "'What are you going to do?' asked Billy Allen. "'I'm going to college,' replied Patsy easily. "'I'm going to be a shot-putter.' "'Good for you, kid,' said Billy. "'What college are you going to?' Billy winked at us, and we watched eagerly, while Patsy's countenance took on its expression of lofty contempt. "'Huh,' said Patsy. "'That was all.' But that eloquent monosyllable consigned all other colleges than ours to the nethermost regions. "'But you'll have to go to school a long time, Patsy,' said I, "'if you expect to get into college.' "'Yep, I know. It's tough, but I guess I can do it. Was, was it hard for you?' I was forced to acknowledge that it had been. "'And you ain't much of a shot-putter, either,' said Patsy reflectively. Foskill had done forty-two eight-and-a-half that afternoon, 
and we were feeling pretty hopeful and good-natured after dinner. Someone mentioned Patsy, and Mosher spoke up. Say, fellas, let's see that little cuss does get into college. What do you say? I'll go you, cried Foskill. He's an all right kid, is Patsy, and he deserves something better than spending his life on the streets. We'll adopt him. Sure thing, said Allen. But we'll have our hands full. And what's to happen when we leave college? We'll get someone to look after him. We'll have a talk with Brother Brian about it. But say, Bull, imagine Patsy putting the shock. We laughed at that, which we wouldn't have done if Patsy had been there. Well, I guess he won't make much of a show at athletics, said I. But if we keep him off the streets, we'll be doing a whole lot. And I like Patsy. We all did. And before we left the table that night, we had the thing mapped out. Patsy was to be cared for and looked after. He was to finish grammar school, go to Latin school, and then to Harvard. And there were to be funds where they'd do good. Yes, we had it all fixed up for Patsy, and we'd have done it just as planned if Patsy hadn't gone and spoiled it all. And it happened like this. When the dual meet came along in June, we were all to the good. We couldn't see how we were going to lose first in anything except the quarter, the high hurdles, the hammer throw, and the broad jump. And we had enough seconds and thirds in sight to make good. If Bull Fosgill could beat Tanner with the shot, we were it. That's the way we had the situation sized up. But, of course, things don't happen just as expected. They seldom do in athletics. Some of the firsts we had claimed went glimmering, and we took in seconds and thirds where we hadn't expected them. But the final result was just about what we had figured it, and along toward five o'clock the meat depended on the outcome of one event, and that event was the shot put. To be sure, they were still fussing with the pole vault, but we were certain of first and third places, and so could discount that. By some freak of fortune, I had managed to qualify with a put of thirty-eight one and a half. There were four of us in the finals, Fosgill, Tanner, and Bert of the Enemy, and I. Of course Patsy was there, and he worked like a Trojan. You could see, though, that it went against the grain with him to fetch for our opponents. Patsy had a good deal of that primeval left in him, and it's safe to say that no one there was more interested. I don't think he doubted for a moment that Fosgill would win and I fancy he thought me pretty cheeky for aspiring so far as the final round. Foskill was ahead with forty-one ten and a half. Tanner had done three inches under that, and Bert and I were fighting along for third place, doing around thirty-eight-six. It was pretty close work, and even the officials were excited. We had finished one round when the accident occurred. Tanner was in the circle. Foskill was down near the end of the tape, and Patsy was close behind him. Tanner hopped across the circle, overstepped, falling the put, and sent the shot away at a tangent. Foskill had turned his head to speak to the measurer and never saw his danger. Tanner let out a shout of warning, and the others echoed it. But it was Patsy who acted. He threw himself like a little catapult at Foskill and sent him staggering across the turf. Then Patsy and the shot went down together. It was all beastly sudden and nasty. When we bent over that poor little kid, he was sort of greenish-white, and I'll never forget the way his freckles stood out. The shot had struck him on the breast, and Patsy's weak little bones had just crushed in. Well, we did all we could, put him in a carriage at the gate, and rushed him to the hospital. He was still breathing, but the doctor said he never knew anything after the shot struck him, not until evening. Well, we were all frightfully cut up, and Tanner sat down on the ground and nearly fainted. Fosgill kept saying, Poor little Patsy, poor little kid, half aloud, and walking around in circles. He wanted to go to the hospital with him, but we told him he could do no good, and we each still had two puts. After a while, we got our nerve back after a fashion, and went on. But thunder, not one of us was worth a hang. I did thirty six and thirty seven eleven, and won third place at that. Neither Fosgill nor Tanner equaled his first records and the event went to Bull at the ridiculous figures of forty-one ten and a half. We got the meet by four and a half points. It was almost six o'clock by that time, and Fosgill and I and three others piled into Alien's auto and raced up to the hospital. They had just taken Patsy off the operating table and put him to bed. The doctor told us that the examination showed that there was nothing to be done, 
the heart had been injured and was liable to stop work any moment. Foskell got the doctor to promise to call him up on the phone if Patsy showed any signs of consciousness, and he left orders that everything possible was to be done. Tanner had begged us to look after the kid and let him pay everything, but though we promised, we hadn't any idea of doing it. Patsy was our kid. We went back to training table, but we were a low-spirited lot, and just when we were finishing dinner, the call came from the hospital. We made a record trip in Billy's machine, and when we tiptoed into the accident ward, the nurse smiled at us. And so did Patsy. He was a pathetic-looking little wisp as he lay there with the bedclothes lifted away from his body, but he smiled and moved his head a bit on the pillow. Fosgill sat down at the head of the cot and leaned over, his mouth all a-tremble. "'Hello, Bull,' whispered Patsy. "'Hello, Patsy,' answered Fosgill, trying to smile. "'Did you—' beat him yes patsy i knew you would i told him so he glanced at me did you beat that other trap i nodded and patsy looked at me with a new respect good for you he whispered are you does it hurt much patsy asked fosgill no not much that's good we'll have you out before long patsy grinned "'Shut up,' he whispered. "'You can't fool me, Bull. I'm a corner.' Foskill muttered something, and Patsy's eyes brightened. "'Bull,' he whispered, "'do you think I had a mother like other kids?' "'I know you did, Patsy.' "'That's good,' sighed the kid happily. "'I guess maybe I'll see her where I'm going.' "'You saved my life, Patsy.' muttered Fosgill, and there isn't a thing I can do for you. I wish. Oh, it's a shame, kid. Huh. I'm glad, Bull. I'd have done most anything for you, Bull. You've been good to me. So's the others. And he closed his eyes wearily for a moment. Then, do you think, he asked slowly, I could have learned to put the shot, Bull, some day? Yes, answered Fosgill sturdily. You had the making of a great shot putter, Patsy. You'd have made a record for yourself, I'll bet. Are you kidding me, Bull? No, Patsy. I'll leave it to the others. Isn't it so, fellows? We nodded vehemently, and Patsy closed his eyes with a smile of ineffable content on his little face. Presently the eyes flickered open again. Anyhow, he said quite strongly and with an approach to his old air of self-importance, anyhow, I guess I won for Harvard today, huh? Yes, you did, Patsy, answered Foskill. We got you to thank for it, dear little kid. Patsy smiled. Then, goodbye, Bull, he said very softly, his eyes half closed. We waited in silence while the moments crept by, but Patsy didn't speak again. End of Patsy by Ralph Henry Barber Read by Donald Cummings The Rabbi's Bogeyman From Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends by Gertrude Londa This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Rabbi's Bogeyman Rabbi Lyon of the ancient city of Prague sat in his study in the ghetto looking very troubled. Through the window he could see the river Moldau with the narrow streets of the Jewish quarter clustered around the cemetery which still stands today and where there is to be seen this famous man's tomb. Beyond the ghetto rose the towers and spires of the city but just at that moment it was not the cruelty of the people to the Jews that occupied the rabbi's thoughts. He was unable to find a servant, even one to attend the fire on the Sabbath for him. The truth was that the people were a little afraid of the rabbi. He was a very learned man, wise and studious, and a scientist. Because he did wonderful things, people called him a magician. His experiments in chemistry frightened them. Late at nights, they saw little spurts of blue and red flame shine from his window, and they said that demons and witches came at his beck and call, so nobody would enter his service. 
If, as they declare, I am truly a magician, he said to himself, why should I not make for myself a servant, one that will tend the fire for me on the Sabbath? He set to work on his novel idea, and in a few weeks had completed his mechanical creature, a woman. She looked like a big, strong, laboring woman, and the rabbi was greatly pleased with his handiwork. Now to endow it with life, he said. Carefully, in the silence of his mysterious study at midnight, he wrote out the unpronounceable sacred name of God on a piece of parchment. Then he rolled it up and placed it in the mouth of the creature. Immediately it sprang up and began to move like a living thing. It rolled its eyes, waved its arms, and nearly walked through the window. In alarm, Rabbi Lion snatched the parchment from its mouth and the creature fell helpless to the floor. I must be careful, said the rabbi. It is a wonderful machine with its many springs and screws and levers. It will be most useful to me as soon as I learn to control it properly. All the people marveled when they saw the rabbi's machine woman running errands and doing many duties, controlled only by his thoughts. She could do everything but speak, and Rabbi Lion discovered that he must take the name from her mouth before he went to sleep. Otherwise, she might have done mischief. One cold Sabbath afternoon, the rabbi was preaching in the synagogue, and the little children stood outside his house, looking at the machine woman seated by the window. When they rolled their eyes, she did, and at last they shouted, You come and play with us. She promptly jumped through the window and stood among the boys and girls. We are cold, said one. Canst thou make us a fire? The creature was made to obey orders. So she at once collected sticks and lit a fire in the street. Then with the children she danced around the blaze in great glee. She piled on all the sticks and old barrels she could find, and soon the fire spread and caught a house. The children ran away in fear, while the fire blazed so furiously that the whole town became alarmed. Before the flames could be extinguished, a number of houses had been burned down and much damage done. The creature could not be found and only when the parchment with the name, which could not burn, was discovered amid the ashes, was it known that she had been destroyed in configuration. The council of the city was indignant when it learned of the strange occurrence, and Rabbi Lyon was summoned to appear before King Rudolph. What is this, I hear? asked his majesty. Is it not a sin to make a living creature? It had no life but that which the sacred name gave it replied the rabbi. I understand it not, said the king. Thou wilt be in prison and must make another creature, so that I may see it for myself. If it is, as thou sayest, thy life shall be spared. If not, if in truth thou profanest God's sacred law and makest a living thing, thou shalt die, and all thy people shall be expelled from the city. Rabbi Lion at once set to work and this time made a man much bigger than the woman that had been burned. As your majesty sees, said the rabbi, when his task was completed, it is but a creature of wood and glue with springs at the joints. Now observe. And he put the sacred name in its mouth. Slowly the creature rose to its feet and saluted the monarch, who was so delighted that he cried, Give him to me, rabbi. That cannot be, said Rabbi Lion solemnly. The sacred name must not pass from my possession, otherwise the creature may do great damage again. This time I shall take care and will not use the man on the Sabbath. The king saw the wisdom of this and set the rabbi at liberty and allowed him to take the creature to his house. The Jews looked on in wonderment when they saw the creature walking along the street by the side of Rabbi Lion, but the children ran away in fear, crying, The bogeyman! The rabbi exercised caution with his bogeyman this time, and every Friday just before Sabbath commenced, he took the name from its mouth so as to render it powerless. It became more wonderful every day, and one evening it startled the rabbi from a doze by beginning to speak. I want to be a soldier, it said, and fight for the king. I belong to the king. You made me for him. Silence, cried the rabbi lion, and it had to obey. I like not this, said the rabbi to himself. This monster must not become my master, or it may destroy me and perhaps all the Jews. He could not help but wonder whether the king was right and that it must be a sin to create a man. The creature not only spoke, 
but grew surly and disobedient, and yet the rabbi hesitated to break it up, for it was most useful to him. He did all his cooking, washing, and cleaning, and three servants could not have performed the work so neatly and quickly. One Friday afternoon, when the rabbi was preparing to go to the synagogue, he heard a loud noise in the street. Come quickly, the people shouted at his door. Your bogeyman is trying to get into the synagogue. Rabbi Lion rushed out in a state of alarm. The monster had slipped from the house and was battering down the door of the synagogue. What art thou doing? demanded the rabbi sternly. Trying to get into the synagogue to destroy the scrolls of the holy law, answered the monster. Then wilt thou have no power over me, and I shall make a great army of bogeymen who shall fight for the king and kill all the Jews. I will kill thee first, exclaimed Rabbi Lion. And springing forward, he snatched the parchment with the name so quickly from the creature's mouth that it collapsed at his feet, a mass of broken springs and pieces of wood and glue. For many years afterwards, these pieces were shown to visitors in the attic of the synagogue, and the story was told of the rabbi's bogeyman. End of The Rabbi's Bogeyman From Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends by Gertrude Landa Read by Matitis Yahu. The Shadow by Laura E. Richards. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An angel heard a child crying one day and came to see what ailed it. He found the little one sitting on the ground with the sun at its back, for the day was young, looking at its own shadow, which lay on the ground before it and weeping bitterly. "'What ails you, little one?' asked the angel. "'The world is so dark,' said the child. "'See, it's all dusky gray, and there is no beauty in it. "'Why must I stay in this sad gray world?' "'Do you not hear the birds singing "'and the other children calling at their play?' asked the angel. "'Yes,' said the child. "'I hear them, but I do not know where they are. "'I cannot see them. I see only the shadow. "'Moreover, if they saw it, they would not sing and call, but would weep as I do. The angel lifted the child and set it on its feet, with its face to the early sun. Look, said the angel. The child brushed away the tears from its eyes and looked. Before them lay the fields, all green and gold, shining with dewdrops, and the other children were running to and fro, laughing and shouting, and crowning one another with blossoms. Why, there are the children, said the little one. Yes, said the angel, there they are. And the sun is shining, cried the child. Yes, said the angel, it was shining all the time. And the shadow is gone. Oh no, said the angel, the shadow is behind you where it belongs. Run now and gather flowers for the littlest one who sits in the grass there. End of the Shadow by Laura E. Richards Read by April 6090, California, United States of America. The Story of Androcles and the Lion From the Animal Storybook, edited by Andrew Lang This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Many hundred years ago, there lived in the north of Africa a poor Roman slave called Androcles. His master held great power and authority in the country, but he was a hard, cruel man, and his slaves led a very unhappy life. They had little to eat, had to work hard, and were often punished and tortured if they failed to satisfy their master's caprices. For long, Androcles had borne with the hardships of his life, but at last he could bear it no longer, and he made up his mind to run away. He knew that it was a great risk, for he had no friends in that foreign country with whom he could seek safety and protection, and he was aware that if he was overtaken and caught he would be put to a cruel death. But even death, he thought, would not be so hard as the life he now led, and it was possible that he might escape to the sea coast, and somehow, some day, get back to Rome and find a kinder master. So he waited till the old moon had waned to a tiny gold thread in the skies, and then, one dark night, he slipped out of his master's house 
and, creeping through the deserted forum and along the silent town, he passed out of the city into the vineyards and cornfields lying outside the walls. In the cool night air he walked rapidly. From time to time he was startled by the sudden barking of a dog, or the sound of voices coming from some late revellers in the villas which stood beside the road along which he hurried. But as he got further into the country these sounds ceased, and there was silence and darkness all round him. When the sun rose, he had already gone many miles away from the town in which he had been so miserable. But now a new terror oppressed him, the terror of great loneliness. He had got into a wild, barren country where there was no sign of human habitation. A thick growth of low trees and thorny mimosa bushes spread out before him, and as he tried to thread his way through them, he was severely scratched and his scant garments torn by the long thorns. Besides, the sun was very hot, and the trees were not high enough to afford him any shade. He was worn out with hunger and fatigue, and he longed to lie down and rest, but to lie down in that fierce sun would have meant death, and he struggled on, hoping to find some wild berries to eat, and some water to quench his thirst. But when he came out of the scrub wood, he found he was as badly off as before. A long, low line of rocky cliffs rose before him, but there were no houses, and he saw no hope of finding food. He was so tired that he could not wander further, and seeing a cave which looked cool and dark on the side of the cliffs, he crept into it, and, stretching his tired limbs on the sandy floor, fell fast asleep. Suddenly he was awakened by a noise that made his blood run cold. The roar of a wild beast sounded in his ears, and as he started, trembling and in terror to his feet, he beheld a huge, tawny lion with great glistening white teeth standing in the entrance of the cave. It was impossible to fly, for the lion barred the way, immovable with fear, and Drockley stood rooted to the spot, waiting for the lion to spring on him and tear him limb from limb. But the lion did not move. Making a low moan as if in great pain, it stood looking its huge paw, from which Androcles now saw that blood was flowing freely. Seeing the poor animal in such pain and noticing how gentle it seemed, Androcles forgot his own terror and slowly approached the lion, who held up its paw as if asking the man to help it. Then Androcles saw that a monster thorn had entered the paw, making a deep cut and causing great pain and swelling. Swiftly but firmly he drew the thorn out and pressed the swelling to try to stop the flowing of the blood. Relieved of the pain, the lion quietly lay down at Androcles' feet, slowly moving his great bushy tail from side to side as a dog does when it feels happy and comfortable. From that moment Androcles and the lion became devoted friends. After lying for a little while at his feet, licking the poor wounded paw, the lion got up and limped out of the cave. A few minutes later it returned with a little dead rabbit in its mouth, which it put down on the floor of the cave beside Androcles. The poor man, who was starving with hunger, cooked the rabbit somehow and ate it. In the evening, led by the lion, he found a place where there was a spring at which he quenched his dreadful thirst. And so for three years Androcles and the lion lived together in the cave wandering about the woods together by day, sleeping together at night. For in summer the cave was cooler than the woods, and in winter it was warmer. At last the longing in Androcles' heart to live once more with his fellow men became so great that he felt he could remain in the woods no longer, but that he must return to a town and take his chance of being caught and killed as a runaway slave. And so one morning he left the cave and wandered away in the direction where he thought the sea and the large towns lay. But in a few days he was captured by a band of soldiers who were patrolling the country in search of fugitive slaves, and he was put in chains and sent as a prisoner to Rome. Here he was cast into prison and tried for the crime of having run away from his master. He was condemned as a punishment to be torn to pieces by wild beasts on the first public holiday in the great circus at Rome. When the day arrived, Androcles was brought out of his prison, dressed in a simple short tunic and with a scarf round his right arm. He was given a lance with which to defend himself, a forlorn hope, as he knew he had to fight with a powerful lion which had been kept without food for some days to make it more savage and bloodthirsty. As he stepped into the arena of the huge circus, above the sound of the voices of thousands on thousands of spectators, he could hear the savage roar of the wild beasts from their cages below the floor on which he stood. Of a sudden, the silence of expectation fell on the spectators, for signal had been given, and the cage containing the lion with which Androcles had to fight had been shot up into the arena from the floor below. A moment later, with a fierce spring and a savage roar, the great animal had sprung out of its cage into the arena, and with a bound had rushed at the spot where Androcles stood trembling. 
But suddenly, as he saw Androcles, the lion stood still, wondering. Then quickly but quietly it approached him, and gently moved its tail and licked the man's hands, and fawned upon him like a great dog. And Androcles patted the lion's head and gave a sob of recognition, for he knew that it was his own lion with whom he had lived and lodged all those months and years. And seeing this strange and wonderful meeting between the man and the wild beast, all the people marvelled, and the emperor from his high seat above the arena sent for Androcles and bade him tell his story and explain this mystery. And the emperor was so delighted with the story that he said Androcles was to be released, and to be made a free man from that hour. And he rewarded him with money and ordered that the lion was to belong to him, and to accompany him wherever he went. And when the people in Rome met Androcles walking, followed by his faithful lion, they used to point at them and say, that is the lion, the guest of the man, and that is the man, the doctor of the lion. End of the story of Androcles and the Lion From the Animal Storybook Edited by Andrew Lang Read by Rosa Grace The Tale of Ginger and Pickles by Beatrix Potter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Once upon a time, there was a village shop. The name over the window was Ginger and Pickles. It was a little small shop, just the right size for dolls Lucinda and Jane Doll. Cook always brought their groceries at Ginger and Pickles. The counter inside was a convenient height for rabbits. Ginger and Pickles sold red spotty pocket handkerchiefs at a penny three farthings. They also sold sugar and snuff and galoshes. In fact, although it was such a small shop, it sold nearly everything, except a few things that you want in a hurry, like bootlaces, hairpins and mutton shops. Ginger and Pickles were the people who kept the shop. Ginger was a yellow tomcat and Pickles was a terrier. The rabbits were always a little bit afraid of Pickles. The shop was also patronised by mice. Only the mice were rather afraid of Ginger. Ginger usually requested Pickles to serve them because he said it made his mouth water. I cannot bear, said he, to see them going out at the door carrying their little parcels. I have the same feeling about rats, replied Pickles, but it would never do to eat our own customers. They would leave us and go to Tabitha Twitchit's. On the contrary, they would go nowhere, replied Ginger gloomily. Tabitha Twitchit kept the only other shop in the village. She did not give credit. Ginger and Pickles gave unlimited credit. Now, the meaning of credit is this. When a customer buys a bar of soap, instead of the customer pulling out a purse and paying for it, she says she will pay another time. And Pickles makes a low bow and says, With pleasure, ma'am. And it is written down in a book. The customers come again and again and again and buy quantities in spite of being afraid of ginger and pickles. But there's no money in what is called the till. The customers came in crowds every day and bought quantities, especially the toffee customers. But there was always no money. They never paid for as much as a penny worth of peppermints. But the sales were enormous, ten times as large as Tabitha Twitchett's. As there was always no money, Ginger and Pickles were obliged to eat their own goods. Pickles ate biscuits and Ginger ate a dried haddock. They ate them by the candlelight after the shop was closed. When it came to Jan first, this was still no money and Pickles was unable to buy a dog license. It is very unpleasant. I am afraid of the police, said Pickles. It is your own fault for being a terrier. I do not require a license, and neither does Kep, the collie dog. 
It is very uncomfortable. I am afraid I shall be summoned. I have tried in vain to get a license upon credit at the post office, said Pickles. The place is full of policemen. I met one as I was coming home. Let us send in the bill again to Samuel Whiskers. Ginger, he owes 22 upon 9 for bacon. I do not believe that he intends to pay at all, said Ginger. And I feel sure that Anna Maria pockets things. Where are all the cream crackers? You have eaten them yourself, replied Ginger. Ginger and Pickles retired into the back parlour. They did accounts. They added up sums and sums and sums and sums. Samuel Whiskers has run up a bill as long as his tail. And he has had an ounce and three quarters of snuff since October. What is seven pounds of butter at one third and a stick of sealing wax and four matches? Send in all the bills again to everyone with comments, replied Ginger. After a time, they heard a noise in the shop, as if something had been pushed in at the door. They came out of the back parlour. There was an envelope lying on the counter and a policeman writing in a notebook. Pickles nearly had a fit. He barked and barked and made little rushes. Ho! Ha! Ha! Bite him, Pickles! Bite him! spluttered Ginger behind a sugar barrel. He's only a German doll. The policeman went on writing in his notebook. Twice he put his pencil in his mouth and once he dipped it in the treacle. Pickles barked till he was hoarse, but the policeman took no notice. He had bead eyes and his helmet was sewed on with stitches. At length, on his last little rush, Pickles found the shop was empty. The policeman had disappeared, but the envelope remained. Do you think that he has gone to fetch a real live policeman? I am afraid it is summons, said Pickles. No, replied Ginger, who had opened the envelope. It is the rates and taxes. Pounds 3, 19, 11, 3 fourth. This is last straw, said Pickles. Let us close the shop. They put up the shutters and left. But they have not removed from the neighbourhood. In fact, some people wish they had gone further. Ginger is living in the Warren. I do not know what occupation he pursues, but he looks stout and comfortable. Pickles is at present a gamekeeper. The closing of the shop caused great inconvenience. Tabitha Twitchit immediately raised the price of everything, a half penny, and she continued to refuse to give credit. Of course, there are tradesmen carts, the butcher, the fishman, and Timothy Baker. But a person cannot live on seed wigs and sponge cake and butter buns, not even when the sponge cake is as good as Timothy's. After a time, Mr. John Dormouse and his daughter began to sell peppermints and candles. But they did not keep self-fitting sixes, and it takes five mice to carry one seven-inch candle. Besides, the candles which they sell behave very strangely in warm weather. And Miss Dormouse refused to take back the ends when they were brought back to her with complaints. And when Mr. John Dormouse was complained to, he stayed in bed and would say nothing but very snug, which is not the way to carry on a retail business. So everyone was pleased when Sally Henny Penny sent out a printed poster to say that she was going to reopen the shop. Henny's opening sale. Grand cooperative jumble. Penny's penny prices. Come by, come try, come by. The poster was really most enticing. There was a rush upon the opening day. The shop was crammed with customers and there were crowds of mice upon the biscuit canisters. Sally Henny Penny gets rather flustered when she tries to count out change and she insists on being paid cash, but she's quite harmless. And she has laid in a remarkable assortment of bargains. There is something to please everybody. End of the Tale of Ginger and Pickles by Beatrix Potter The Tale of Tom Kitten by Beatrix Potter 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This book is dedicated to all pickers, especially those that get upon my garden wall. Once upon a time there were three little kittens, and their names were Mittens, Tom Kitten, and Moppet. They had dear little fur coats of their own, and they tumbled about the doorstep and played in the dust. But one day their mother, Miss Tabitha Twitchit, expected friends to tea, so she fetched the kittens indoors to wash and dress them before the fine company arrived. First, she scrubbed their faces. This one is Moppet. Then she brushed their fur. This one is Mittens. Then she combed their tails and whiskers. This is Tom Kitten. Tom was very naughty and he scratched. Mrs. Tabitha dressed Moppet and Mittens in clean pinafores and tuckers. And then she took out all sorts of elegant, uncomfortable clothes out of a chest of drawers in order to dress up her son Thomas. Tom Kitten was very fat and he had grown. Several buttons burst off. His mother sewed them on again. When the three kittens were ready, Mrs. Tabitha, unwisely, turned them out into the garden to be out of the way while she made hot buttered toast. Now keep your frocks clean, children. You must walk on your hind legs. Keep away from the dirty ash pit and from Sally Henny Penny and from the pigsty and the puddle ducks. Moppet and Mittens walked down the garden path unsteadily. Presently, they trod upon their pinafores and fell on their noses. When they stood up, there were several green smears. Let us climb upon the rockery and sit on the garden wall, said Moppet. They turned their pinafores back to front and went up with a skip and a jump. Moppet's white tucker fell down into the road. Tom Kitten was quite unable to jump when he was walking upon his hind legs and trousers. He came up the rockery by degrees, breaking the ferns and shedding buttons right and left. He was all in pieces when he reached the top of the wall. Moppet and Mittens tried to pull him together, but his hat fell off and the rest of his buttons burst. While they were in difficulties, there was a pit, pat, paddle, pat, and the three puddle ducks came along the hard high road, marching one behind the other and doing the goose step. Pit, pat, paddle, pat, pit, pat, waddle, pat. They stopped and stood in a row and stared up at the kittens. They had very small eyes and looked surprised. Then the two duck birds, Rebecca and Jenima Puddle Duck, picked up the hat and tucker and put them on. Mittens laughed so that she fell off the wall. <laughs> Moppet and Tom descended after her. The pinafores and all the rest of Tom's clothes came off on the way down. Come, Mr. Drake Puddle Duck, said Moppet. Come and help us to dress him. Come and put him up, Thorn. Mr. Drake Puddle Duck advanced in a slow sideways manner and picked up the various articles. But he put them on himself. They fitted him even worse than Tom Kitten. It's a very fine morning, said Mr. Drake Puddle Duck. And he and Gemina and Rebecca Puddle Duck set off up the road, keeping step. Pit, pat, paddle, pat, pit, pat, waddle, pat. Then Tabitha Twitchit came down the garden and found her kittens on the wall with no clothes on. She pulled them off the wall and smacked them and took them back to the house. My friends will arrive in a minute and you are not fit to be seen. I am affronted, said Miss Tabitha Twitchit. She sent them upstairs. And, I am sorry to say, she told her friends that they were in bed with measles, which was not true. Quite the contrary, they were not in bed, not in the least. Somehow there were very extraordinary noises overhead, which disturbed the dignity and repose of the tea party. And I think that someday I shall have to make another larger book to tell you more about Tom Kitten. As for the puddle ducks, they went into a pond. All the clothes came off directly because there were no buttons. And Mr. Drake Puddle Duck and Gemina and Rebecca have been looking for them ever since. 
End of The Tale of Tom Kitten by Beatrix Potter That Bell by Paul Blake This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Barry was a boy of many characteristics. The most notable were an amazing love of sleep and a desperate activity when awake. He seemed to lay in a fresh stock of energy every time he had a nap, and although the most difficult boy in the world to waken, when he was awake he was irrepressible. It was winter. Barry found that season of the year did not agree with his constitution. This getting up in the middle of the night is killing me, he remarked one day to a group of sympathizers. He had the whole school on his side in this particular matter, for work before breakfast in winter was decidedly unpopular. At half-past seven every boy had to be at his desk putting in an hour at mathematics before prayers and breakfast. It was pitch dark at seven, when the bell rang as a signal to rise. It is curious how difficult it was to hear that bell in winter. Barry never heard it, or rather, never heeded it. He scorned to rise till twenty minutes past seven. He could do it, as he termed dressing, in ten minutes, and had been known to do it in five. On such occasions his personal ablutions were apt to be rather neglected. "'That old bell is at the bottom of it,' remarked Culverwell, another boy, who found that the heavy clang disturbed his slumbers. "'It's John who's at the bottom of the bell,' put in Millward. "'I wish he'd resign.' said Barry. It's time they pensioned him off and sent him to a hospital for incurables. He's a hopeless job, said Millward. I spent half an hour one day trying to make him understand that I was willing to stand him a shilling if he'd give us a few minutes grace in the morning. But he's as deaf as a post, and though he took my shilling he rang us up more punctually than ever the next morning. I wish he'd hang himself with his bell rope, said Culverwell. They eyed the offending bell, which hung idly in its turret, built over what was once a stable, but was now part of the school building. "'I wish we could muffle the old thing,' said Millward, looking wistfully up. "'It's freezing hard, and twill be deadly work getting up tomorrow.' "'I believe I could shy a stone up and crack it,' suggested another. Barry had been silently inspecting the building. "'Tell you what, you fellows,' he said at last. I believe I could get up there if I had a ladder. Out of the small classroom window, jump on the ledge, then creep up the roof by the chimney, then a ladder over the space to the turret. If you fellows will hand me up the ladder, I'll go. They were all dumb for a moment at his audacity. Then Millward said, How are you going to get into the small classroom? It's always locked in playtime. So tis, assented Culverwell. Then I must get up to the ledge with a ladder, and then pull it up after me. You're a plucky beggar, exclaimed Millward in admiration. Shouldn't we have a jolly snooze in the morning if you should stop that old bell's jaw? I will, too, said Barry. There must be a ladder somewhere about. There's the one John uses to clean the outside of the windows, suggested Millward, but it isn't long enough. It may do, said Barry. Come along, let's get hold of it. This is just the time. It's dark, and tisn't tea time for half an hour. It was just five o'clock, and nearly every boy was indoors. Few cared for sliding on a worn slide in the dark, and a game was out of the question. So the three boys had small fear of being discovered as they prowled about in search of John's ladder. That worthy was having his tea, and was not likely to be disturbed by any noise, for he was stone deaf. The boys hauled out his ladder, almost from under his nose, without his hearing a sound. Culverwell kept cave, while Millward held the ladder for Barry to ascend. It was a plucky, if not perilous, feat to attempt in the dark, but Barry was abounding in pluck, and the spirit of adventure made him keep his nerve. He soon found himself on the ledge, and managed to haul up the ladder after him. It was an assistance instead of an encumbrance in crossing the roof and he soon was within a dozen feet of the turret. The boys below anxiously waited for his reappearance, but he had a job before him. His idea was to unship the tongue of the bell. He had a glorious reward if he could succeed, 
for John would never know if the bell rang or not. It would be superb to have the old factotum pulling away at his rope and fancying he was fulfilling his duty when the tongueless bell was swinging silently on its pivot. Barry worked the tongue this way and that, but it was a difficult job. The inside of the bell was as dark as the inside of a wolf, to use a hunter's simile. He had to feel everything, and the metal was terribly cold. However, at last he managed to unhitch it. He deliberated what to do with it, now he had it. He put it in his pocket, and descended as quickly as was consistent with security. "'Off with the ladder,' was his first order. They soon had it in its place again. Then they felt safe from detection. "'What are you going to do with it?' asked Millward, alluding to the rusty tongue which Barry exhibited. "'I think I shall leave it at the bottom of the turret. If I take it away, they'll know someone's been up. But if we leave it here, they'll think it's dropped down.' "'Let's hope they will,' said Culverwell, dubiously. "'At any rate, I'll chance it,' continued Barry. "'So you fellows will be able to have a tall time tomorrow morning, "'and we shan't get called till half-past eight at the earliest.' The sequel proved the correctness of Barry's prophecy. Old John sought his bell-rope punctually at seven, as usual, rang away steadily for three minutes, and then retired to his den to commence his never-ending job of shoe-cleaning. One or two boys awoke from sheer habit, but hearing no bell, they went to sleep again. The rest slumbered peacefully on, little thinking to whom they owed their unwanted repose. The whole household were asleep. The big bell was the signal for rising to everyone, servants included, with the exception of John and his wife. Her duty was to light the schoolroom fires, after which she retired to her own part of the house to prepare her husband's breakfast. These two almost useless pensioners on the doctor's bounty inhabited two rooms apart from the rest of the house. How long every one would have slept cannot be known, perhaps till nine, for when one depends on a bell for waking, one waits for the accustomed sound. But dogs are not like human beings, and Fido, who always had his breakfast at eight, began making a great disturbance at a quarter past. Fido woke his mistress, the doctor's wife. She looked at her watch, 8.15. She was surprised beyond measure, as there was a strange silence everywhere. But the clock on the mantelpiece confirmed her watch, and two minutes later bells were ringing in a manner which brought the servants out of their beds with a jump. By half-past eight, everyone, boys and all, had been awakened informally, for the bell refused to make a sound. John was summoned, and was at last made to understand what was the matter. He asseverated warmly that he had rung the bell, and went on a tour of inspection. He found the tongue on the ground, and obtaining a ladder from the gardener next door, fastened it in its place again before it was time to ring for school. "'Never had such a gorgeous sleep in my life,' said Millward warmly to Barry. "'We'll vote you a silver tankard as a reward of merit.' "'Pity the trick can't be played twice,' remarked Culverwell. They don't seem to suspect anything this time, but if it were to happen again, there'd be an inquisition. Barry heaved a regretful sigh. It was hard to think that at seven next morning the inexorable bell would toll out as usual the knell of the parting night. Something that day put him in a peculiarly reckless mood. More than that, he did not get his usual afternoon nap. He was disturbed by an inconsiderate master who wanted to know when his exercises were going to be handed in to him. So five o'clock found Barry ready for any deed requiring more cheek than usual. The bell. It struck him directly after he had written his last line. Whatever might happen, he would have one more good sleep. He did not confide his intentions this time to his two friends. He knew his way now. In five minutes he had captured the ladder and placed it against the wall. He was just stepping off it onto the ledge, when he heard footsteps beneath him, perilously near. If he attempted to draw up the ladder, the noise must attract attention. His only chance was to keep still, in the hope that the ladder wouldn't be noticed in the dark. But it was. Old John happened to have finished his tea earlier than usual, and was on his way to fetch an armful of wood. "'Now who's been taking my ladder?' he said to himself. Suppose it's one of them boys wanting to get their balls off the ledge. 
He put the ladder on his shoulder and marched off with it. Barry listened in horror. He did not know it was John who had captured his only means of retreat. Whoever it was, he must throw himself on his mercy. Hi! he called out, in a voice meant to combine a shout and a whisper. Hi, you there! It was a shout this time and no mistake, but it had no effect. Barry knew now it must be John. It was no use to shout. He tore off a piece of plaster and shied it in the direction of the retreating figure. It struck the ground close to John, but he did not hear it. Poor Barry was left alone on the ledge, fourteen feet from the ground. He couldn't drop, for there was a nasty grating just beneath him. Besides, he could not lower himself from the narrow ledge. He might have done it in daylight, but not in darkness. Even his pluck must draw the line somewhere. It was an uninviting night, and not a boy was out of doors. There was nothing for it but to accept the inevitable and remain where he was until something happened. He knew well enough what would happen. After tea there would be a calling over. He would be unable to say, add some, and inquiry would be made, resulting in his capture and punishment. Once more he proved himself a true prophet. Everything fell out exactly as he had anticipated, and by the time he was assisted down he was so cramped and frozen he would have welcomed a caning on the spot to warm him. Intentionally or unintentionally, the authorities did not connect his being on the ledge with the outrage on the bell of the day before. He received the usual punishment for missing calling over, but beyond that nothing was done. Probably the master who captured him considered he had already received punishment enough. At any rate, Barry was of the opinion that he had bought his extra hour's sleep rather dearly. End of That Bell by Paul Blake Read by Donald Cummings The Tears of Princess Brunella from The Other Side of the Sun storybook by Evelyn Sharp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Blakeney Clark. There is no doubt that Princess Brunella would have been the most charming little girl on either side of the sun if she had not been so exceedingly cross and discontented. She was as pretty as anyone could wish to see, and as accomplished as all the gifts of fairyland could make her, and she had every bit of happiness that the love of her parents and the wit of her fairy godmother could put in her way, and yet she grumbled and grumbled and grumbled. "'Can you not try to be happy, just for five minutes?' asked the Queen in despair. "'How can you expect me to be happy, even for five minutes, when every five minutes is exactly like the last five minutes?' sighed the little princess. "'It is tea-time, your highness,' said the head nurse coaxingly, "'and there are pink sugar-cakes for tea.' "'There were pink sugar-cakes yesterday,' pouted the princess. "'There are always pink sugar-cakes, unless there are white sugar-cakes, "'and I am equally tired of them both. "'Can you not tell me something new?' "'Let her go without her tea,' said the king, "'who was rather tired of having such a cross little daughter. "'But the queen only smiled.' "'The child wants a change,' she remarked. "'It must be very dull to play all alone all day.' "'Dull?' exclaimed the king. "'Why should it be dull? "'Has not her godmother given her such wonderful toys "'that they can play with her as well as be played with?' "'This was quite true, "'for the very ball that the princess threw to one end of the nursery "'could catch itself and throw itself back to her, "'and it is not every ball that can do that.' "'What more can a child want?' demanded the king crossly. The queen, however, thought there might be something more. "'We must find her a playfellow,' she said wisely. "'Stuff and nonsense!' protested the king. "'And why should we bring more crying children into the palace? "'However, you must do as you like, I suppose.' The king always told the queen to do as she liked when he was tired of the conversation. So the queen smiled again and issued a proclamation at once to tell the whole world that the Princess Prunella wanted someone to play with and would be ready to choose a playfellow that day week at twelve o'clock in the morning. 
Now it is not often that one gets a chance of playing with a king's daughter, so it is no wonder that, when the princess followed her royal parents into the great hall on the appointed day, she found it filled from end to end with all the little princes and princesses, and all the little counts and countesses, and all the little dukes and duchesses that the surrounding kingdoms could produce. "'I never had a more excellent idea,' said the queen as she seated herself on the throne and looked down at the crowd of children. "'Prunella has talked of nothing else for a week, and she has not been heard to grumble once.' "'That's all very well,' observed the king a little uneasily, "'but it is quite clear that she cannot play with them all, "'and who knows that so much disappointment will not lead to a war?' "'The queen did not answer, but turned to her little daughter, "'who stood by her side. "'Do not be in a hurry,' she said to her. "'So many faces are confusing at first, "'and you might regret it afterwards if you made a mistake.' "'But Princess Prunella showed no signs of being in a hurry. "'She just glanced over the sea of faces that were turned towards her, and then looked speechlessly at her mother. The smiles had all gone from her face, and the big blue eyes were filled with tears. "'Why, they are all exactly alike,' she said piteously. "'I cannot tell one from another.' And then, to the astonishment of everyone in the room, she dropped down on the steps of the throne and began to cry. "'Dear, dear, what is to be done?' exclaimed the Queen in much alarm. "'It will look so very bad if all the children have to be sent home again.' "'It will certainly lead to a war,' was all the king said, and then they both looked helplessly at their sobbing little daughter. As for all the children, they were so surprised at hearing how much alike that they were, they said nothing at all, and it is difficult to tell what would have been the end of the matter if the princess had not suddenly jumped to her feet and pointed towards the door. "'There is the prince I should like to play with,' she exclaimed. "'He is not like the others, for he has a wonderful look on his face.' Everybody looked round at the doorway, and sure enough, there stood a boy whom no one had noticed before. "'Come here, prince,' commanded the princess, raising her voice haughtily. "'You may kiss my hand, if you like.' But the boy drew back, with a bewildered air, and shook his head. Princess Brunella stamped her foot angrily. "'How dare you hesitate when I tell you to come here!' she cried. At this, however, the strange boy turned and hastened out of the room altogether, and a loud murmur of astonishment rose from the children. The king's daughter had never been disobeyed in her life before, and for a moment she was too astonished to speak. "'Who is he? What is his name?' she demanded at last. There was a pause, broken presently by the shrill voice of one of the pages. "Uh, "'Please, your highness, it is only Deaf Robert, the minstrel's son,' he said. "'Deaf?' repeated the princess. "'What is that?' "'It means that he cannot hear anything, little daughter.' explained the queen. So, you see, he would not do for a playfellow at all. Besides, he's not even a prince. Can you not choose one of the others instead? The princess, however, could do nothing of the kind. All these are alike, she said again, but the minstrel's son had a wonderful look on his face, and I will have no one else for a playfellow. So all the children went sadly back to their homes, and wondered why they were so much alike and the whole court was made uncomfortable once more by the sulkiness of Princess Prunella. "'Your Highness's best wax doll has not been out for two whole days,' suggested the head nurse. The princess snatched the doll from her hands and threw it on the floor. "'If you will not let me play with the boy who is deaf, how can you expect me to play with a doll?' she asked. And although, no doubt, there was much in what she said, it was hardly the way in which to speak to the head nurse. Indeed, There would have been a serious disturbance in the royal nursery that very next minute if the princess's cream-coloured pony had not suddenly trotted round the stable of its own accord and put it into her head to go for a ride. Now, the princess's pony was in fact a fairy pony, so when he ran away with her in the forest that day, it was not to be supposed that he would run away with her for nothing. He took her, in fact, for a real fairy ride, all through a fairy forest that began by being quite a baby forest and then grew and grew the deeper she went into it until it ended up being quite a grown-up forest. And the pony never stopped running away until he reached a dear little grey house that was set in the brightest of flower gardens right in the middle of the forest. The princess slipped off his back and pushed open a little gate and walked into the flower garden. Anyone else might have been surprised to find Jeff Robert sitting there in the middle of the trim green lawn, but after a fairy ride, one is never surprised at anything, so the princess's heart just gave one big jump for joy, and she ran straight up to him and took his hand. "'Poor deaf boy! Poor deaf boy!' she said softly. 
Certainly she was not behaving like a king's daughter, for she ought to have been extremely angry with him for disobeying her in the morning, instead of which she spoke as gently to him as any ordinary little girl might have done, but then, as he could not hear what she said to him, what was the use of speaking like a princess? Poor deaf boy, she repeated, bending over him. No wonder you look so dull and unhappy. It was the first time in her life that she had forgotten she was a princess, and she was quite surprised at the gentleness of her own voice. She was still more surprised when the deaf boy rose to his feet and bowed very low and answered her. I was only unhappy, princess, because I could not hear what you said to me this morning, he exclaimed. Oh, cried the princess, you can hear me now. Ah, yes, said deaf Robert. I can hear you now, because you speak so kindly. It is only when people are angry and speak roughly that I cannot hear them. That is why they say I am deaf. Have you always been deaf? asked the princess, wondering. Ever since the wimps came to my christening, answered the minstrel's son, for when they asked my father what gift he would choose for me, he chose that I should be deaf to every sound that was not beautiful. So that is why you have such a wonderful look in your face, said Princess Prunella. I wish the wimps went to everyone's christening. Deaf Robert shook his head. If they had not come to mine, he remarked, I should have been able to hear what you said this morning. Never mind, said the princess. Come back to the palace with me now. I will never speak crossly to you again, and then you will always be able to hear what I say. No, no, answered Robert, shrinking away. I cannot come to the town. It is so silent there. It frightens me. Silent? echoed the princess. Surely it is a forest that is silent. Oh no, said the minstrel's son, smiling. The forest is full of sound. Can you not hear them all talking? The bees and the flowers and the great pine trees? Princess Brunella listened. No, she said, shaking her head. I can hear nothing. Then she took the deaf boy's hands and pulled him towards the gate. Come back to the town with me, she said eagerly. It is true that you cannot hear the other people's voices, but you will always be able to hear me, and that is ever so much more important. So the minstrel's son went back to the palace with Princess Prunella, and when the king and queen saw how happy their little daughter was at last, they said nothing more about deaf Robert not being a prince, but got over the difficulty by making him a marquis on the spot, and giving him the appointment of play solo in chief to her royal highness. A magnificent banquet was given to celebrate this important event, at which several speeches were made by the king, and several tunes were played by the band. But as the speeches were exceedingly pompous, and the tunes were exceedingly noisy, the new marquis, for whom they were intended, heard neither one nor the other. However, he heard every word that the little princess whispered in his ear, and perhaps that was all he wished to hear. Never had life passed so peacefully at the palace in the days that followed. The princess was never heard to utter an angry word, and she went about with a contented look on her face that cheered the hearts of all who knew her. It was indeed a happy day for the court when the minstrel's son came to play with the king's daughter, and everyone rejoiced that the king and queen had been wise enough to let their little daughter have her own way. But all this, while well, no one thought of the minstrel's son. Now, anybody might suppose that a minstrel's son, who suddenly found himself made into our marquis and playfellow-in-chief to a princess, would be the happiest boy in the world. And yet, although he grew fonder every day of his little playfellow, dear Robert was the saddest person in the whole court. He grew more and more silent as the days went on, until at last even the princess noticed that he was changed. "'The wonderful look has gone from your face,' she said to him. "'Can it be that you do not feel happy at court?' Then the boy Marquis told her the truth. "'I am unhappy because I cannot hear the sounds of the town,' he said. "'Will not your father go and live in the forest for a change, so that we may play there, instead of in this horrible, silent place?' "'I don't want to go and play in the forest,' objected the princess. "'There are no people in the forest, and I should forget that I was a person myself "'if I had nothing to talk to but flowers and trees.' "'For the first time since they played together, "'deaf Robert remembered he was nearly two years older than the little princess, "'and he smiled in a superior manner. "'That is only because you hear all the wrong things,' he said. "'If you could once hear the sounds of the forest, "'you would never want to come back to the town.' The princess turned red with anger, and she opened her mouth to give the minstrel's son a thorough good scolding, which would certainly have surprised him had he been able to hear it. But she remembered in time that he would not have been able to hear it, so she sighed impatiently and answered him as softly as she could. 
You are quite mistaken, she said, putting her chin in the air. If you were a real boy, you would understand. And with that, she turned and left him. It was certainly annoying not to be able to lose her temper whenever she felt inclined, but there was nothing to prevent her from remembering that she was a princess. That afternoon, the princess pricked her finger, and the minstrel's son found out what she had said was quite true, and he was not a royal boy at all. For, of course, the princess did what any other little girl of twelve years old would have done, and burst into tears, while the minstrel's son, who was quite unable to hear her sobs, only stared at her solemnly, and wondered why her pretty round face had suddenly twisted into such a strange expression. "'What are you doing, Prunella?' he asked her gravely. "'Doing?' wept the princess. "'Why, I am crying, of course. "'That is what you would be doing "'if you had pricked your finger as badly as I have.' "'She held out her small white finger as she spoke, "'but the minstrel's son only stared at her as solemnly as before. "'Crying? What is that?' he asked. "'And why should you do anything so useless? "'Surely it would be better to fetch a doctor "'or a piece of sticking plaster.' "'Princess Brunella came to the end of her patience.' It had been bad enough to exist for six whole weeks without being allowed to lose her temper once, but now that she found she could not even cry with any pleasure, she felt it was more than any little girl of twelve years could be expected to bear. "'It isn't a sticking plaster that I want,' she said miserably. "'When people cry, they want to be comforted, of course.' "'Do they?' said deaf Robert, looking perplexed. "'But if I cannot hear you cry, how am I to comfort you?' The princess was far too cross to be reasonable, although she managed to remember it was no use letting her crossness appear in her voice. "'That's just it,' she sobbed. "'You ought to be able to hear me cry, and then you would be a real boy.' And the princess pitied herself so much for being forced to play with someone who was not real that she buried her face in her hands and wept more than ever. She half hoped, even then, that deaf Robert would come and kiss her and make friends again as any nice boy would have done at once, but deaf Robert did nothing of the kind, and when she at last took her hands from her eyes, her playfellow was gone. Truly, the forest had never looked so beautiful as on that day that the minstrel's son hastened through it on his way to his old home. The flowers looked their best, and the birds sang their merriest, and the trees bent their greenest boughs to give him welcome, but the boy with the wonderful look on his face, who had lived among them for so long, never paused so much to glance at them, and they only had time to notice as he passed by that the wonderful look was no longer there. On he hurried until he came to the little grey house, set in the garden of bright-coloured flowers, and he pushed open the gate and walked in, just as his princess had done six weeks ago. The minstrel was at home this time, and he was sitting on the doorstep in the sunshine. He had just composed a new song, and that always made him extremely happy, but he sighed a little when he saw his son come into the gate for he had no difficulty in seeing that the wonderful look had gone from the boy's face. "'What is the matter, my son?' he said anxiously. Dear Robert wasted no time in greeting him. "'Father!' he cried. "'Why did you ask the wimps to be in my christening?' "'That is easily answered,' said the minstrel soothingly. "'It was because I wished you to hear nothing but beautiful sounds all your life.' "'But what sounds do you call beautiful?' demanded his son. The minstrel sighed. "'Can you not hear my music?' he asked. "'Yes, yes,' said deaf Robert. "'But what else?' "'It had never struck the minstrel that there need be anything else, "'and he hesitated a little. "'Well,' he said at last, "'can you not hear the sounds of the forest?' "'Deaf Robert looked up at the pine trees overhead "'and down to the flowers at his feet. "'I used to be able to,' he said sadly, "'but even the forest has grown silent now.' Then he clenched his fists and looked imploringly at his father. "'Must I live to the end of my days without hearing any of the things that other boys hear?' he cried. "'You are a little unreasonable, my son,' said the minstrel. "'Are not the beautiful sounds of life enough for you?' "'Enough,' said deaf Robert. "'I want much, much more than that, father. Why, I want to hear the princess cry.' "'That is nonsense,' exclaimed the minstrel. "'Tears make a most unpleasant noise, and you would be extremely disappointed if you were to hear the princess cry.' The minstrel's son drew himself up proudly. "'You do not understand. You are not real either,' he said. "'The tears of my princess make the sweetest sound in the world, and I am not going to rest until I learn to hear it.' 
Then he turned and walked through the gate and out of the forest once more. The minstrel looked after him and sighed. It was the best gift I could think of, he murmured. It was the one I would have chosen for myself. It is true, he added thoughtfully, that I never wanted to play with the king's daughter. The minstrel's son wandered aimlessly through the forest, the forest that he had once liked so well because it was all his, and that he only liked now because he had found his little princess in it, and there he might have been wandering still if he had not met a wimp. This was not really surprising in that particular forest, for it was just the kind of forest in which any boy of fourteen might at any moment meet a wimp, but for all that, deaf Robert was just a little bit startled when the wimp suddenly dropped into his path from a tree above and nodded at him. Hello, said the wimp. What is the matter with you? I am very unhappy, because I am not a real boy, exclaimed deaf Robert. Dear me, how is that? asked the wimp, pretending to be surprised. Well, you ought to know, answered deaf Robert. It is all because the wimps came to my christening. Nothing of the thought, cried the wimp indignantly. It is all because your father insisted on knowing better than we did, and we let him have his own way. If the wimps had been at your christening, we would not even want to be a real boy. So you cannot hear the princess cry, eh? That's a good wimpish joke, that is. And the wimp stood on his head and choked with laughter. It is all very well for you to laugh, complained the minstrel's son. You don't know how unpleasant it is to be a boy without being a real boy. The wimp came down on his toes again and stopped laughing. Then why don't you go and learn to be a real boy again? He asked in surprise. How can I find out the way? asked deaf Robert. You ridiculous boy, exclaimed the wimp. Why, the first person you meet will be able to tell you that. Deaf Robert had no time to thank him for his information, for the wimp began turning somersaults the moment he finished speaking, and he went on turning them until he had turned into nothing at all, and there was no more wimp to be seen. Then the minstrel's son walked on through the forest, and for three days and three nights he met no one at all. But on the morning of the fourth day, he came to the very edge of the forest, and there he saw an old woman sitting by the side of a blackberry bush. Hurrah! cried Deaf Robert, waving his cap. Do you know that you are the first person I have met, and that you are going to tell me how to become a real boy? I will tell you at once, said the old woman, smiling, for you come straight to the point, and do not beat about the bush. This is what you must do, then. Something brave, and something kind, and something foolish, and something wise. If you are not a real boy after that, it will be your own fault. Then she walked round the blackberry bush and disappeared. And although deaf Robert forgot what she had just said about him and beat about the bush in good earnest, he never saw any more of her. Then the minstrel's son walked straight on in search of the brave deed to do, and this did not take him long, for there are always plenty of brave deeds waiting to be done by someone. So, long before the sun was above his head that day, he came to a castle where a beautiful princess was being kept captive by a cruel old giant, all because he was cruel, and for no other reason at all and when deaf Robert saw the princess weeping behind the bars of her prison window, he was reminded of his own little princess, whom he had left weeping on the nursery floor, and that made him call on the giant instantly to come out and be killed. The giant laughed a great laugh and came into the courtyard, not to be killed, but to kill the minstrel's son instead. But before he had time to do that, the minstrel's son had managed to kill him, and that was the end of the cruel old giant. "'That is the bravest deed I have ever seen done!' cried the princess when he fetched her out the dungeon. "'Brave deeds are easily done, then,' said deaf Robert, but he was glad indeed all the same to hear that he had done the first part of his task. The next thing he did was take the beautiful princess back to her own country, and that seemed to him a great waste of time, for he could not certainly do his own kind deed as long as he had the princess on his hands. But when they reached her country, and the princess told her father how deaf Robert had come out of his way to bring her home, the old king was pleased, and asked him what reward he would like for his trouble. For he said, you have done the kindest deed anyone could possibly think of. No reward for me, laughed deaf Robert, for there is my kind deed done, without my knowing it. And off he set once more on his travels. After that, the minstrel's son wandered about for a great many days, for neither a wise nor a foolish deed could he find to do. Sometimes, when he thought he had been wise, the people told him he was cruel and drove him out of the country, and sometimes, when he was sure he had been foolish, they only praised him for his kindness. 
He grew tired and footsore, and his clothes became old and ragged, and he almost forgot that he had once been a marquis and playfellow-in-chief to a princess. But he never forgot how the little Prince Prunella had looked as she sat on the nursery floor and wept with sobs that he might not, that he was not able to hear. So two years passed away, and still he had not learned how to be a real boy. One day, as he walked along a country road, he came upon a girl driving cows. "'Why are you looking so sad?' she asked him. "'Because I left my princess crying in her nursery two years ago, and I have been away from her ever since.' "'answered the boy, simply. "'The girl burst out laughing. "'Well,' she exclaimed, "'that was a foolish thing to do.' "'Foolish?' shouted deaf Robert. "'Did you say foolish?' "'To be sure I did,' laughed the girl. "'Could anything be more foolish "'than to keep away from someone "'whom you want to be with?' "'Then I will go back to her this instant,' "'declared the minstrel's son. "'And that would be the wisest thing you could do.' answered the girl, and she immediately disappeared, cows and all, which just shows that she must have been a wimp all the while. Well, said deaf Robert, there are my wise and my foolish deeds done together, and now I am a real boy. Then he set off homewards as fast as he could go, and although it had taken him two years to come away from home, it took him only two hours to get back again, so it is clear that the wimps had had a hand in that too. And just about tea time, he stood outside the nursery door in the palace of his own little princess. It is well to remember that the wimps had come to the christening of the minstrel's son, otherwise it might seem a little wonderful that the Princess Prunella should have pricked her finger again on the very day that her playfellow and chief came back to her. Anyhow, that is what happened, and, as the minstrel's son stood outside the door and listened, he heard the softest and sweetest and the prettiest sound he had ever heard in his life. Hurrah! he cried. At last I can hear the princess cry! And he burst open the door and ran into the room, all in his rags and his tatters, and knelt down to comfort the king's daughter. Oh, look at my finger, wept Princess Brunetta as she showed him her little hand. Truly it was impossible to tell which of her small white fingers the princess had pricked, but as the minstrel's son kissed every one of them in turn, it is clear that he must have healed the right one, and that, of course, was why the princess stopped crying at once. Then she looked at her old playfellow, and laughed for joy to see him there again. "'The wonderful look has come back into your face,' she said, "'but it is ever so much more wonderful than before.' "'Dear little playfellow,' whispered the minstrel's son, "'I can hear the forest sounds again too, "'but you were right all the time, "'and the sounds of the town are much more charming "'than the sounds of the forest.' "'Oh, no,' declared the princess, "'there you are quite mistaken, "'for the sounds of the forest are more beautiful by far, "'and it is a fact that they have been disputing the point ever since.' End of The Tears of Princess Brunella from The Other Side of the Sun Storybook by Evelyn Sharp Reading by Blakeney Clark Uncle Wiggily's Lemonade Stand by Howard R. Garris This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. One day, as Nurse Jane Fuzzy Wuzzy opened the kitchen door in the hollow stump bungalow, she saw Uncle Wiggily squeezing juice from a lemon. Oh, Wiggily, are you making a lemon pie? asked the muskrat lady. Just then, some of the sour juice squirted in her eye and she squirmed like an angleworm. I guess I made a mistake that time, sadly said the bunny, but I am trying to make lemonade. After Uncle Wiggily had helped Nurse Jane wipe the lemon juice out of her eye with a towel, the muskrat lady asked, Why are you making lemonade, Uncle Wiggily? The bunny gentleman said that some of the animal children wanted to start a lemonade stamp so they could sell cool drinks on hot days and give the money to the fresh air fund for poor animal children. So the stand was started. Uncle Wiggily helped Nanny the girl goat and Curly the pig to make lemonade to sell from a street stand. The first customer was Mr. Stubtail, the bear gentleman. Nanny handed him a glass 
and when no one was looking the piggy boy took some lemonade i'm not saying that was right though we hope you like our lemonade mr stubtail said nanny please bring nettie and becky to our stand i'll drink this lemonade said mr stubtail and then i'll go get nettie and becky and treat them he put the glass to his lips but no sooner had he taken a sip than he dropped the glass and roared oh ah. uncle wiggily wanted to know what was the matter and nanny and the piggy boy were surprised too sour too sour howled mr stubtail i like sweet lemonade nanny ran into uncle wiggily's bungalow and brought out some sugar which she poured into the lemonade while the piggy boy stirred it round and round i guess this will be all right for our next customer spoke uncle wiggily soon along came curly's father mr twisty tail he tasted some of the fresh air lemonade mo bunk he grunted it's quite too sweet i like lemonade sour our customers are getting mixed in our lemonade said uncle wiggily to nanny and curly as he sent them to the store to get more lemons i'll mark each pail so i'll know which is sweet and which is sour lemonade so the bunny marked a large s on one pail to show it was sweet and he marked a large s on the other pail to show that it was sour now everything will be fine said the bunny all at once uncle wiggily happened to think that just the letters on the pails weren't enough i can't tell sweet from sour as each begins with the letter s said the bunny i wonder what i'd better do just then the bad fuzzy fox and the worse woozy wolf sprang out of the bushes you'd better keep still while we nibble your ears they howled first have some lemonade invited the rabbit what kind of lemonade have you barked the fox looking hungrily at uncle wiggily's ears both kinds sweet and sour replied the bunny then i'll take both kind mixed chuckled the fox trying to be funny one kind will be enough for you and it doesn't make any difference what kind cried uncle wiggily and he threw the whole pail full of sour lemonade over the bad fox oh wow what does this mean barked the fox it means that i am tired of having you make fun of my lemonade cried the bunny and i'm tired of waiting for your ears howled the wolf as the fox ran away it's time you made a home run also mr wolf chuckled the bunny then he threw pale lemonade and all at the wolf who ran away also and more lemonade was made for the children End of Uncle Wiggily's Lemonade Stand by Howard R. Garris Read by Nemo Uncle Wiggily's Queer Umbrellas by Howard R. Garris This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Wiggily hopped out one day to have an adventure, and, as it looked cloudy when he started, he took his umbrella. The rabbit gentleman had not hopped very long before it began to April shower. I'll just hoist my umbrella, said the bunny. He was going along when he noticed Aunt Letty, the goat lady, without an umbrella oh please take mine begged the bunny i'd like to get wet oh thank you bleated aunt letty but can't we both walk under this umbrella 
Uncle Wiggily said no, as he wasn't going her way. The bunny was getting quite wet when up hopped Mr. Croker. Here is a large toadstool for you, Uncle Wiggily, grunted Mr. Croker. You may use that for an umbrella. I am used to the rain. Uncle Wiggily thanked the toad and looked at Mrs. Twistytail. Uncle Wiggily had not been under the toadstool umbrella very long before Mrs. Twistytail the pig lady came along with nothing to keep the April showers off her new bonnet. Oh, please take this toadstool, begged the rabbit uncle. I don't need it. Mrs. Twistytail said he was very kind and invited him to walk under it with her, but he was going the other way. I like to get wet, he said politely. Uncle Wiggily hopped along in the rain without an umbrella, when, all of a sudden, he heard a voice say, Quack, quack, quack. Come over here, Mr. Longears, and I'll give you a Japanese parasol we don't need. We ducks just live in the water. The bunny thanked Mrs. Wibblewobble, just as Uncle Wiggily raised the paper umbrella, which kept off the rain. Along came Mrs. Cluck Cluck the hen. Oh, please, Mrs. Cluck Cluck, take this Japanese parasol that Mrs. Wibblewobble loaned me, cried Uncle Wiggily to the hen lady when he saw she was getting all wet. Oh, but I'll be robbing you, cackled Mrs. Cluck Cluck. Nonsense, laughed Uncle Wiggily. I don't mind April showers. Besides, maybe. I can get under the pan with this kind dog I see coming along. Keep dry, Mrs. Cluck Cluck. Oh, Uncle Wiggily, barked the ragged but polite tramp dog. It won't do for you to get wet. Take my umbrella. I made it out of an old dishpan I found and a broomstick. It will keep you dry. As for me, I'll stand out in the rain and wash my clothes that way. Uncle Wiggily thanked the tramp dog, and just then the bunny saw Mrs. Bushytail, the squirrel lady, coming. I must help her, he thought. Uncle Wiggily had no sooner stepped under the pan umbrella than along came Mrs. Bushytail. The squirrel lady was getting all wet. Oh, my dear Mrs. Bushytail, cried Uncle Wiggily. Pray allow me. This isn't a stylish umbrella but it will keep off the wet. And the bunny stood in the April shower as Mrs. Bushytail scrambled off. Then, out of his house, with some pancakes, came Mr. Stubtail, the nice bear. Look here, Uncle Wiggily, said Mr. Stubtail. There's no need of you getting wet. Here are some very tough pancakes my wife made. I can't eat them. Rain won't hurt them. Fasten them on a stick and they'll keep off the rain. The bunny, thanking the bear, did this, and Uncle Wiggily was hopping along through the rain with his pancake umbrella, when out popped the skillery scalery alligator. Wait a minute, grunted the alligator. Oh no, answered Uncle Wiggily. I know what you want, my ears. The gator growled. Well, I'm so hungry I must eat something. Stand still until I get to you. But Uncle Wiggily wouldn't do that. Here, nibble some of Mrs. Stubtail's griddle cakes, he cried. They are so tough, you can chew on them for a week, and I can get away. Then the sun came out. End of Uncle Wiggily's Queer Umbrellas by Howard R. Garris Read by Nemo. Uncle Wiggily Squirt Gun by Howard R. Garris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. One day, when Uncle Wiggily was out early to see the sun rise, he passed a rocky ledge 
from which hung many icicles as the sun shone on the sticks of ice they turned all the colors of the rainbow how wonderful exclaimed the bunny who made them a little chap beside him said i did i am jack frost and because you have been kind to me i'll give you the power to make icicles whenever you wish to make icicles jack frost told uncle wiggily just push the squirt gun out will come water and by magic power it will freeze into icicles the bunny thought this would be fine so he hopped through the woods soon he came to a deep ravine he wished to cross but there was no bridge and it was a long way around i'll try jack frost trick now said uncle wiggily out of the magic jack frost gun squirted water it fell and froze making a bridge of icicles across the gully ha this is just fine laughed uncle wiggily crossing the ice bridge he did not see the bad fox looking after him what game is that rabbit up to now growled the fox i must follow and see he has made a bridge where there was none before i can cross after him and catch him having crossed the icicle bridge uncle wiggily kept on until he came to the home of uncle butter the goat help me down uncle wiggily he bleated i was mending a leak in my roof and the old fox came along and took my ladder the bunny said he would help his friend and pointed the squirt gun oh i said help me not shoot me cried uncle butter and mr longears just laughed i'm not going to shoot you said uncle wiggily this is jack frost's magic icicle gun i'll make a ladder for you so the bunny did and the goat gentleman came safely down the bad old fox who had stolen the ladder away thinking it would help him catch uncle wiggily peeked around the corner i wonder how i can get that rabbit thought the fox as the bunny was about to hop on after having helped uncle wiggily down off the roof the bunny traveled on with a magic jack frost squirt gun soon he came to where mrs twistytail the pig lady lived oh such trouble squealed the pig lady my clothes sticks are gone and all my nice clean clothes will sag down in the dirt uncle wiggily made ready the gun i'll freeze some icicle clothes sticks for you mrs twistytail he said icicle clothes sticks i never heard of such things squealed floppy the little piggy chap who is using the rake to help his mother hold up the line it can't be done declared curly i'll show you laughed uncle wiggily he squirted three or four streams of water up in the air when the water froze it turned into icicles and the pig lady used them to hold up the sagging lines having done a kind act for mrs twistytail by making icicle clothes sticks uncle wiggily hopped along he was tramping through the woods when all of a sudden the bad fuzzy fox ran out from behind a bush now i have you he howled you can't get away uncle wiggily pointed his magic gun ha ha i'm not afraid of a bit of water snickered the fox you can't do anything all of a sudden uncle wiggily began to squirt streams of water from jack frost's magic gun up and down the bunny made icicles in the air their ends resting on the ground until he had made a cage with bars of ice all about the fox let's see you get me now laughed the bunny as he started for his bungalow fooled again howled the fox who would think he could freeze me in like this end of uncle wiggily's squirt gun by howard r garris read by nemo